Hello and welcome to this edition of the Human Rights Conversation. With me today is my co-host, the disability rights activist, former UK government advisor, business consultant and sociology lecturer, Miro Griffiths. And joining us from her base in London is the activist and campaigner, Michelle Daly. Welcome to you both. Hi. Hello. The English physicist, cosmologist, author and public intellectual Stephen Hawking passed away last month. Hawking was a towering figure in our culture for three decades. So, Mira, I'll start with you. What will be his legacy, do you think? Um, well, I think he's, he's demonstrated how, uh, with the right level of support, he's been able to access uh, institutions and opportunities to create uh, groundbreaking research. Um, and, and whilst people talk about his activism within disability, which I think came on later in his life, uh, I think it, it, it's a significant point to to realize that with the right level of support and by changing the environment as opposed to the individual, you can have opportunities to um, take prominent positions within academia or within uh, public and, 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 and private uh, workspaces as well. Interesting comments there, uh, Michelle. Um, in the commentary that I've read, of course, people refer to his disability. But do you think that's something that people remember in the general conversation around Stephen Hawking? I just want to echo what uh, Miro said as well and pick up on your point. I think um, what what Miro, um, sorry, what Stephen Hawking did was to demonstrate that our aids and equipment is not a burden. Because often we think about disabled people, we um, think about our wheelchairs, um, um, ventilators and so on as being a burden. And I think that what Stephen Hawkins did was to demonstrate that if a, a wheelchair wasn't a burden, a ventilator wasn't a burden, and, and a communication aid wasn't a burden, and if we didn't have those equipments and if he didn't have the improvement in technology, he wouldn't have achieved what, what he did. And going back to your point about, um, did you say his legacy around... Um, what he's achieved. I, I put this to you because I don't know if you've seen this image that's been circulating since his death. There's a, the, it's a black and white one. I'll I'll try and link it, uh, link to it in the notes for this program. But there's a black and white image of uh, an empty chair, and Stephen Hawking standing up, looking towards the the great beyond, and. I, from my conversations with Miro, with Dr. Paul Dark, this looks like straight out of the ableist control room. So what's being suggested, and other disability rights activists have picked up on this, is that somehow Stephen Hawking has, has now, is now free in death. He's no longer burdened by his dis the, the disability that has been part of his life and part of his story. So I'm just wondering, when, when we look at when we look at the legacy of Stephen Hawking, will it focus on this great author, this incredible scientist, this man who's able to popularise really, really difficult constructs, ideas? And, and will the disability be a footnote or will it be an important, integral part of his story? I think it very much depends on who you speak to. Um, and I think it depends on how informed individuals are. Um, so when we talk about his legacy, for myself and Miro, we have to recognise, and because we're informed, that his impairment was part of who he is. Um, and when we think about the whole concept around disability, it, um, it's not scratchy in many ways, but the disability is a barrier, is what he experiences, it's not, it's not with him. So in terms of thinking about the image, I haven't seen that image, but just when you explain the image to me, yes, it's saying that he was free from his wheelchair and now he's dead, he's, he's a free man. It, it, it really depends who you're speaking about. You have groups of people who, who are up for assisted dying, um, and they might think, oh, yeah, that's great, he, you know, he's free. But if you speak with people who are empowered, who, are, who are, have been informed, they're going to take a different angle on this. Um, so his legacy, for, for me, I think is pretty much showing that, as I said, to repeat, is that equipment is about his liberation. It allowed him to achieve what he wanted to achieve, and his impairment was part of who he is, and it wasn't a negative part of, part of him. As, as being the greatest person. But I think we should also recognise um, with Stephen Hawking that his success did come around about the fact that he, he entered education as a non-disabled man. Mm. And that is not the reality for many disabled people. Many disabled people didn't have the opportunity to achieve what he achieved. And his success did come around the fact because he's a privileged man, he had a privileged upbringing. So we can't take that fact away. And that shaped the opportunities that he achieved. So what we can learn from that is we need to recognize that 
privileged people do have opportunities. The fact that he was a white, disa- a white disabled man, and also he started out as a white non-disabled man. And we have to pick up on those points and recognise. And that's why I say it depends on who you speak with and depends on people's backgrounds as well. So Stephen Hawkins, what we have, we see two sides. Is one, he's a great scientist, a disabled scientist, but also he had opportunities that many disabled people don't have. It is not the reality for many disabled people. And we have to recognise that many disabled people have to fight for access to services, and um, uh, there's lots of cuts to services. But what we saw with Stephen Hawkins is that he had great support, great access to equipment, which doesn't reflect the reality for many disabled people. The real legacy is you are able to use him as representation that can be achieved if the right support is put in place. I think that's a really important point because it's a, it's it's it leads to a, a sense of uh, exploiting his his presence as a role model. Because it, it goes, you know, it becomes problematic that you have him being used as an example. That if you know, if you put your mind to it, you'll be able to achieve whatever. But actually, by doing that, as Michelle said, it kind of disregards the various forms of of social oppression that people have in terms of reduced support systems that are available now, and the extensive deliberate work that's being carried out to to ensure uh, segregation and, and marginalisation continues. So, you know, the thing about what Michelle said, if he because because and again because his impairment. Um, became more visible and prominent later on in his in his in his research, because he was at a prominent university and he was doing groundbreaking research. He was afforded that level of support and a, and a, and expertise to help him with his condition um, and in terms of engaging in everyday life. But actually, if let's say his research wasn't deemed important or or necessary, would we have actually seen somebody who would then have gone straight into the usual t- typical journey and trajectory of institutionalization? Uh, redu- you know, reduce life chances. So actually, it kind of highlights issues around how disability is linked to social class. And I think that's something that I was getting from what you were saying, Michelle, because it's so easy to to just dismiss all these issues affecting disabled people and use them as a beacon status, particularly particularly by um, you know government states and who want to try to say that everything is great for disabled people if you just try hard enough and it's your own individual responsibility. So I think there is something here around how we, we, we must be very cautious to use them as a role model for, for the sale people in, in so far that just try hard and you'll be able to succeed. We're going to um, drill down a little bit into the issue of a class later on in our conversation, if you, if you allow. But let me just push back at some of the points that you've made, Michelle, and your last point, Miro. It's a little curmudgeonly to say that we need to be careful about the fact that Stephen Hawking was a role model. Yes, he was a role model, and I know that there's a lot of sensitivity around this issue of, yes, he was inspirational. But at the same time, it has to have mattered that for three decades, the world's smartest man was disabled, had an impairment. That has got to matter. That's also part of his legacy, surely. Well, I th- again, I, I suppose there's, there's, there's two different issues going on here, isn't it? As, as we kind of touched on, one is the support required and the fact that you're not changing the individual, you're, you're, you're uh, creating the parameters within society to ensure that a person can be included uh, and valued. But Picking up again on a, on, a, on a point that I think Michelle made, um, and hopefully I've, I've understood it correctly, but it highlights this issue of disability pride. And because it wasn't a case of, uh, you know, try, uh, triumph over adversity, it wasn't a case of, um, I want to be free of my body, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like who I am. We, we can take from this the importance of disability pride and disability culture, because we direct attention to saying, well, actually, look, here's somebody who... who was successful in terms of their research, in terms of their positions of, of authority and, and, and areas that, that they could influence in. But actually, for, for main sale people, it's the frustration and anger felt uh, because they don't get the same opportunities because of the barriers within, within society and the social structures here. So what I think is, is, is we, we draw from, from him as, as an activist, and again, it, you know, Michelle's point is very key, depending on who you're talking to, um, but what I get is a sense of actually how he was able to demonstrate alternative ways of existing and participating because of the use of assistive technology, uh, support equipment and, and support services. Because it kind of disrupted that sense of normal ways of behaving, normal ways of, 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 of being in society. Because you know, he, was, he was an academic, but he used 
different piece of technology in order to create his research, in order to express his research and talk about the accessibility of, of his ideas. So it, 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 so it disrupts that sense of this is the only way that you can be an academic or this is the only way that you can be um, a researcher. It was a, it was a way of disrupting that, that idea of, of normality, I suppose. I think also just to add to that point, I think what, what, what Stephen Hawkins also did was challenge the notion that disabled people with higher support needs um, don't have relationships. And, you know, he did get married and he did have a very, very successful career. So in terms of when you were going back to the early question about legacies and stuff like that, he, he, he represented the fact that if you've got all, and I think we have to recognize the fact that he achieved what he achieved because of the equipment and because of the support, and which is a great thing really, because for many disabled people, um, it's seen that it's difficult to achieve, it's hard to do things because they don't have access to what he had. Now, if we, if every disabled person had access to the same opportunities, the same level of education, and the same support, the discussion would be different. And the reason we're focusing on this because it's one of one of one of one. There's not many. And the reality is, it should be we having this discussion. No, and we're having discussion because he's the only disabled per- successful disabled person in academia and achieved so much with the level of support that he has had. We know, of course, that Stephen, Haw- Stephen Hawking was the author of this incredible book, a bestseller, Brief History of Time, sold 10 million copies around the world, translated into more than 30 languages. I'm going to argue that his profile around disability rights was not as great for very obvious reasons. Uh, and in these podcasts, in these conversations with you, Miro, I've argued that these issues can be considered a detail and we can talk about uh, bigger stories. The, the impairment shouldn't be the end of the story. It isn't the only narrative. There are other things that are part of a, of a person's identity. Let me just tell you about this that I dug up in research. In the preface to the World Health Organization's first world report on disability in 2011, Hawkins wrote, we have a moral duty to remove the barriers to participation and to invest sufficient funding and expertise to an unlock the vast potential of people with disabilities. Now, you can't get a a clearer statement than that. He was on the same side as, as, as both of you. What I want to ask you now, and we'll start with you, Michelle, is how did society, how did the mainstream media in particular, deal with this issue of Hawkins and his disability? Was it just this medical model approach where he was considered to be a role model, gave people hope, was an inspiration, and we just put that to one side? Or did society, did mainstream society, governments, media, did the non-disabled world really engage with the fact that this, that this incredible talent had Lou Gehrig's disease? From my personal view, I'm not speaking for other disabled people or anyone else, I don't think that there was any real mention about Stephen Hawkins having impairment. You could see it, but whether it was recognized when it was reported. And I think it was one of those things what happens when someone says, we don't see that, and it's a way just to ignore it. So he can't be as intelligent as he is um, because he had an impairment. So in terms of what happened, I think there was a, 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 a we, there was a kind of ignoring, let's park that aside. We won't speak about the impairment aspect but we'll look on him as Stephen Hawking because you can't be disabled and, and achieve what he achieved. And it's just repeating all the things we said. So I think there was a clear, and I, I, this is my view, a clear um, erasion, really, in many ways, of the fact about his impairment. And if it was spoke about, as we said, it was being um, an inspiration. Is, is an inspiration as a disabled person because he can communicate, because he can achieve these things. And I think that's happened, as we have to repeat, keep going back, he was able to achieve that. I think we're forgetting he was able to achieve that because of the support and level of equipment that he had. And I think we haven't joined the dots and made the connection around that. And I think, and the reason is because of the way that we think about impairment, think about disability, we haven't thought of that as part of a human being. And so therefore, I think the media was challenged around how they were going to report it in a positive way. On that point, Miro, how could the public conversation around motor neuron disease have taken place? How could, how could Stephen Hawkins have been the, the, the opportunity to have a wider public conversation about impairment? 
Well, it's no surprise that there, there was no, uh, you know, I suppose, social model analysis of, of his position or indeed um, the discussions we've just been having around social class and, and the privileges that he had um, already uh, prior to, to the onset of his impairment. When you have just one incredible icon who has an impairment, isn't the weight on his or her shoulders so great that people with impairments look to that person to be the champion of disability rights. And, I'm, and, and I put it to you, how could he have done that? How could he have led a conversation about what it means to have motor neurone disease, what it means to live with impairment, what are the support services and the funding of the NHS, NHS which he publicly defended, what, what level of financing is necessary to maintain these services so that these people's lives are, are rich and fulfilled? Did he have the media clout the access to have been the rallying point for such a public conversation or is that expecting too much of him was he just a scientist who was interested in writing books and bringing science to the to the wider public well i, I think there's, there's a couple of issues coming out of what you're saying firstly we have to remember that he was a scientist and that he had he was a non-tailed person who transitioned into the world of of disablement and and social oppression and marginalisation to an extent because of his of its privileges, and although he did use his position um, to highlight issues of you know, the the accessibility of higher education, uh, geopolitical issues, and, and aspects of of social security, it's arguably no surprise that actually we're, we're not we're not talking about a watershed moment in Stephen Hawking's you know activism around disability rights because it's not comparable to the to the the numerous activists around the globe who have been uh, empowered, who are talking about social model thinking, who are trying to challenge uh, issues of, of disability from, from, a, from a position of human rights and, and social injustice point of view. But the other, and I suppose from that, we have to recognize that just because you're disabled doesn't mean that you have uh, the authority or the capability to represent the, the entire disabled people's community on issues around social injustice and marginalization and i think sometimes the media uh, don't acknowledge that um and actually we because he's a, he's in a position of of influence and prominence in terms of his uh, of his public image we just assume that because he's disabled then we can talk to him about disability issues and that can be very dangerous and damaging um for the for the for the for the disabled people's movement in trying to advance uh disabled people's emancipation but I think, there's, on the other hand, um, what I would have liked to have seen was we have a, a you know the, the 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 prevalence of, of of Stephen Hawking, of his career, of his life, um, and obviously now his death. And whereas I would have hoped, and I, and, uh, and I think Michelle would agree with me based on what she's been saying, what, based on what she's been saying, is that you would have hoped then that a discussion could could take place on those issues around social class, on those issues around. Uh, access to support services on the idea of the of the deserving and undeserving tail people rhetoric which is used by by government and the media but we didn't get any of that all we got was media accounts of you know uh, a scientist who was trapped inside his body because of his condition or despite suffering from incurable disease he could achieve this and this um, and that tri that line of triumph over adversity and that comes out because the media uh, perpetuate this notion of a medical model of disability, i.e. that the barriers you experience are, are, are because of the health condition that you have and therefore those who have, have succeeded is because they've, they've tried hard enough and, and tried hard enough and that line is used by media um, because again we, there is not, we don't have empowered um, politic, political political tale people in these positions in the media uh, and in reporting uh, to, in order to advance these discussions, we have very small examples. You know, in the UK, I'm thinking of the Disability News Service, who gave an account of of how Stephen Hawking's uh, uh, presence was a was a was a was a demonstration of the various different aspects of support required to live your life. But you know, the, the mainstream newspapers, the mainstream news articles, TV channels didn't cover any of that because it's not of interest to them. Because they don't connect the dots, as, as Michelle's highlighted, um, and because they, they 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 carry on using the same narrative around disability, which is a medical model approach, and one that does not um, recognise um, the the importance 
of disability pride and disability culture that has emerged from the disabled people's movement. And I think there's a, an important point that you made, which was around Stephen Hawking's being a champion and some other bits that you said. And I think there has to, you know, for example, mirror point as well, there has to be some recognition that being the fact that Stephen Hawking was born into a privileged background, he may not have recognised that these things had come to him. I'm, I'm just making my own assumption. Yeah, I'm guessing. That he think that the things that he achieved and his success was because of who he, he is. And there's also this thing, if you're in a certain position, you assume that you have a given right to this. Mm. And in many ways, he, he did have a given right because the average disabled person, from depending what class or background they're from, have to pay loads of money for the wheelchair that he had. Now, me and Miro know the cost of wheelchairs. Now, his wheelchair wasn't cheap. Now, he did have a given right. He got the wheelchair. He got the equipment. The things that he had was expensive. So when we're talking about being a champion, champion to say people, would he have been the appropriate champion? Because he didn't really reflect, reflect the average disabled person. But what he did do, so one hand I'm saying, speaking like I'm negative, but I'm being negative. I'm speaking from somebody who comes from a certain background and class. Would I have I looked to Stephen Hawkins for my inspiration? I'm not sure as a child if I did, because it wasn't within my reach. The reality of what he did do when I became older and understood, what he done is show that you can have a successful career, you can achieve things if you have these equipments and all the resources. But for for someone like myself and Miro to achieve that, we have to fight and you have to fight for lots of hurdles. What we what what we hope is that the system and the government can see that Stephen Hawkins achieved things what he achieved because you were in his interest. He 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 interests you. And you liked what he did. It shouldn't be. The story shouldn't be that we should be rewriting these books and saying everybody should have the same opportunities to have, be able to improve their life chances. So just picking back up again around the media bit, um, Ryan Francis, who's a journalist for The Guardian, she wrote an article after Stephen Hawkins died. And she said that he won, he, he won the respect um, for disabled people because he gave her hope in many ways. But she picked up all the things that we spoke about. So as I go back to my point in the beginning, it depends on who we speak to. And also when we speak about champions and people inspire us, again, it's who you speak to and what background you come from. Can that person relate to the individual you're speaking about? Is it in somebody's reach? Or reach, I mean, are they in their, in their circles of network? And the reality is Stephen Hawking wouldn't be in the circle. He's somebody you see on TV and someone you read about Um he didn't come from the same struggles as someone like Ray Charles, for example, who's a disabled black man who struggled and suffered. His mum had to send him away to get an education. That wasn't the reality for Stephen Hawkins. They both were successful, but the realities are very different in what they experienced. Finally on this segment then, Michelle, is Stephen Hawking a once-in-a-generation towering icon, or did he by the sheer weight of his intellect, the scale of his achievements, create space for other people with impairment to also come to prominence, to also show, if that's the word that we should use, that impairment is no barrier to a career, to success in academia and in other spaces. So what I'm trying to get at, is there a direct line between a brief history of time and the widespread acclaim for the Paralympics 20, 30 years later? We would hope not that he was a once in a lifetime. We would hope that there would be opportunities for other disabled people to achieve what he achieved. Um, but again, we have to go back on what we said in the beginning. He did start off in a position which gave him the opportunity to achieve what he achieved. What we need to be seeing is if you have people who don't have that added advantage that he had, would they achieve what he achieved? And that's what we need to see come through the door now. We need to see other disabled people being able to achieve what he achieved. I'm hoping that he wasn't once in a lifetime, but we need to see um, if the barriers get removed for people to get through the doors. And we're just talking about Stephen Hawkins as a white disabled man. What about as a black disabled person or a gay disabled person with all those other intersex, uh, intersex what go on? We don't, we don't know what the, the, the situation would be like. I'm hoping things will change. I have hope. I'm hoping it will be different for the future.
Miro, you're in academia. We hope that you'll soon be Professor Miro Griffiths, a sociology lecturer. Did he open doors? Has he created space for, for you and others who have come, come along 20, 30 years later? I, I, I recognise that I'm, I'm, I'm generally pessimistic. Um, and that, that might influence and colour what I'm about to say, but I would just be mindful that we are talking about him in, in a time of uh, widespread austerity, um, the prominent discussions around assisted suicide and euthanasia. Mm. Um, so when you when you position this this issue at the current um, within the current environment where uh, disabled people's life chances are being uh, reduced and we and we are reversing uh, many of the support systems um, and and human rights legislation and frameworks that are that are there to protect disabled people. I think it's very difficult to think about how this is going to be um, he, that he individually, his icon, his icon status will 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 provide more opportunities for tail people because I think there's something um, again connecting to what we talked about talked about just before. There is a there is a real deep concern that um, if we dismiss um, the fact that he was white, the fact that he was European, uh, middle to upper class. Uh, highly educated in, in his fields, um, and that he was non-disabled and transitioned to, a dis- to the disability world. Um, if you dis- if you dismiss all that, what happens is is that then that society looks at him as an, as an example, and raise the expectation for everybody else who is disabled, and say, well, look, Stephen Hawking did it, so why can't you do it? So actually, there's a danger that he, that by um, by him taking one step forward, it pushes all the ta- every every other tail person back because actually expectations rise but the support and mm. the discussions around the issues that Michelle and I have highlighted are not even addressed and deliberately not addressed because it's because they are inconvenient to the state and to organizations that want to keep the, the system the way it is um, is that it, it becomes a, a useful way of just dismissing these complex discussions that need to be had in order to uh, realize Sail people's inclusion within society. I think this is the moment now to discuss this issue of, of um, Stephen Hawking's social and ethnic background. And clearly, that's been the elephant in the room throughout our conversation so far. Uh, of course, we know that his parents both went to Oxford. He was gifted from an early age. He went to Oxford as as Miro said, he transitioned to disability. He went on to to write this bestseller and to have an amazing career. Is it your view, Michelle, that his social and ethnic background was important to his success in Britain? Most definitely, yes. It, that that is, we can't say otherwise. It was um, he achieved what he achieved. I'm just going to be repeating myself because of who he was and because of his privileged background and because of the opportunities that were given to him and because of the circles of networks and people that he had access to. And, for example, um, I remember watching his, his film, um, I forgot what the title was called, Theory of... Brief History of Time? Oh, no, in, Theory, of, Theory yeah, of Everything? Theory of Everything. And there was a bit in there where he um, um, started to, where he lost his ability to speak verbally. And he needed to use a communication aid. He had access to friends who were able to help him kind of design and think about how he does these things. Now, again, depend on your background, depends on who, who you have access to and to the resources. He had a helicopter of people hovering over his life who was able to provide those resources and opportunities and things for him. So in terms of when going back to your question, did he achieve what he achieved because of who he was and because of being a... It's not just the fact that he was a white man. He was a white, privileged man, which makes a big difference. So if we look at um, the work of John Powell, who talks about whiteness and white privilege, Stephen Hawkins was a testament to that. So even if he wasn't disabled, he possibly would have been successful. The fact that he was disabled, I think that gave him even more advantage in many ways because we're able to show that the university, um, Cambridge University, supported him tremendously. Now, they were able to support him because they could see, op- I, you know, this is my views here, and I might be, people might criticise me for this as well. I think they could see opportunities out of the fact that him being a disabled man, being, being extremely academic, 
And it was like, we're going to give them kudos, you know, how we've supported a disabled person. We have to recognize some of these things. Um, and he got those opportunities. We have to recognize the power of whiteness and the privileges that he had and, and the legacies around how people from certain backgrounds, the doors automatically open. And the doors did open for Stephen Hawkins. And, it, you know, we, there's, there's, there's two things that come from it. Good things, what he did in terms of representation for disabled people, but also we cannot ignore from the conversation the privileged background that he had created many doors, many, many doors, that is not the reality for many disabled people. Well, let me just push back at that. Okay, yes, it's true, Stephen Hawkins is operating in a in the British class system. There's no doubt about that. We can see privilege. The, the, the previous government that uh, I think Miro was part of was full of old Etonians. The British class system remains intact. We know that. But at the same time, using your own evidence, Michelle, uh, other people with impairment have come through. Isn't, it, isn't the iron law of this is that the society, the media, the powerful elites, yes, they will pick off individuals that that speak to them in some way that allow them to show to 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 put forward this idea of the plucky underdog who who overcomes uh, whatever difficulty he has to to progress in society. Yes, there are many examples of that. Is it your point that there are many talented people who are not getting the opportunities that Stephen Hawking had because they are not white, male, and privileged? Of course, if you are from a different background, you're you're not white. You're whether you're black or, or non-disabled and you don't have the privileged background that Stephen Hawking said, you have to work much harder. And the glass ceiling is much higher. Um, so to crack that glass ceiling is going to be a much, much higher. So in sure going back... Kudos to, applies to those black people with impairment who are amazingly talented and who wants to break through. Clearly there is... Th 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 there should be an interest in academic institutions, media institutions all of the, the, the citadels of power to take those people up and to use them, as I say, to, to, to push forward the, the medical model of disability, if you want to theorize around that, or to push forward this notion of the plucky underdog who overcomes these disadvantages to succeed in society. So why should it be different for, for, for black or for minorities, for, for, for women, for, with peop for people with different sexual orientation? Why should it be different for them? I think um, we need to think about who leads many of the, the, the prominent positions in, in, in society. So one of the things I'm going to look at is look at the work of Kimberly, sorry, Professor Kimberly William Crimshaw. I'll just give her a title here. So she, she speaks around intersectional erasure. Now, one of the things that she does is gets us to think about who are in leadership positions. Now, in order to think about that, you're going to think I'm giving a bit of a long story. We need to think about who do we think leads things, who runs groups, et cetera, et cetera. And when we think about that, we usually think of white, non-disabled men. Or white is the key thing. And what that does is those individuals are the individuals who are the ones who develop and determine the agenda, what to put forward. And often what they do is they, it's based on their own interests and their own ways of, you know, their own interests of what they want to achieve. And what that does is it raises other things that affect people's lives. So they think of things in one, one direction, which is single issues. And so going back to your point is, well, given that Stephen Hawke has achieved what he achieved because he was a disabled person, for them, it wasn't about thinking about all the other bits around people from LGBT background, black people. It was about thinking about their agenda and not having that information uh, because they don't come from that background. They don't come from that class. So therefore, it's a rage from their thinking. And therefore, that's how we start getting discrimination and the glass ceiling getting higher. So it also, we need to think about the work of... Um, uh, uh, Professor John Powell, who speaks around white privilege. So, there's a lot, we can't just talk about it in, in isolation. We have to think about how the human being thinks and behaves and the people in position of power. And when you think about when you join the work of Kimberly William Crimshaw and Professor John Powell and what they have to say, you can start seeing how we get to the point of discrimination. 
and where and how discrimination excludes individuals. And also when you draw into that, you start thinking about the social model. So when you start putting all these theories together, you start seeing how different groups are excluded. The issue is, is that people from privileged backgrounds, as I'm going to repeat, I said, is that there's an assumption that you have a given right to achieve what you're going to achieve. But when you start adding to other other identities to that, it's not within their thinking. It's not within their, their circle of network. They don't think about having to invite different people to a party because that's not within their circle. They haven't had to think about a, different, a difficult road in the way we have to think about a difficult road. So the, the bit about going, talking about the door should be open because it would give people opportunities, but they haven't had to think about that. And it's another thing that's important to think about, and, and John Powell speaks about this, and I like the way he makes a point, is we all speak about inclusion, and we think about inclusive education. And I'll give this as an example. But how many people from middle-class backgrounds would put their child in a working-class background school where majority of the children may be accessing free meals or parents don't work and other social issues? It be, it, so when we say they have it, they speak about it, but do they live? will they live in our communities? Miro, you've been in government. That's a major bastion of power. You're in academia now. Uh, are things as clear as Michelle suggests, or are things changing? No, absolutely. I, I agree with, with, with Michelle's points uh, uh, totally. I think because you've got... You, what, if I take this to a kind of macro level, you've got this idea of what it means to be a human being. And many of the, uh, again, my background in sociology, many of the, what we refer to as post-humanist writers who want to critique this idea of, of the human being, talk about how um, you know, government, higher education, uh, all these social structures, they, they assert a, a trajectory that privileges um, the rationality, the reason, and actions of, of certain types of people. And uh, one person in particular, an academic called uh, Bridotti, uh, she, she, you know, she argues that the human depicts um, a sort of abstract ideal and symbol of classical humanity, which is rooted in European values. So, you know, the typical white middle to higher education, uh, middle to higher social class uh, with a, with a with a prominent uh, higher education, uh, typically non-disabled person. Uh, and and all those other aspects of of, of privilege, when and that, and together that produces this this archetypal um, uh, aspiring individual that we want to to try and reinforce within our social structures. So people who don't fit into that are then classed as the other. And then when you're classed as the other, you're seen as either a disruption or a hindrance or a threat to the to the functioning of of society. And that's why we've seen examples of disabled people. LGBTQI uh, community, uh, p people of, uh, of minority ethnic groups, all of that are pushed to the sides in order to uh, cement the position of the of the uh, the current Westernized idea of what it means to be a human being. Um, and until we can disrupt that and challenge it, and I, and I complete completely agree with you know Michelle's point of of you have these positions of power occupied by. This, this this archetypal view of the of the human being and then of course they they want to leave a legacy for their work so what do they do they look to the next person who is going to replicate or reflect what their values are and what they what they are wanting to to achieve so then the person takes over the position who is the same person so you never get this opportunity to uh, destabilize and disrupt these current these current uh, frameworks because you're because the people in power are always trying to replicate who they are and what they're doing in their work, and that's why I think again, you can have as much education as you want around issues of equality and and, and human rights and marginalisation. I don't think it actually goes as far as people th hope it will do, because at the very top are the people who are who are setting the agendas. And as Michelle, said, I think it's you know it's a it's a great line around intersectional erasure. It's a great line around deleting aspects of the agenda that don't fit with the narrative that those in power want to want to produce. And that's why when you have examples of, um, you know, 
uh, of individuals who who do become prominent from these backgrounds which are which are incredibly marginalized um we we focus so much attention on them but as we've we've kind of said throughout um this interview it's we don't join the dots together and we don't think about what are the consequences of of that person's identity that has prevented other people from similar communities and similar backgrounds coming through and just to add to that miro i think um the work of uh, Millie Hill, who's a black disabled woman who mm. passed away, she speaks around um, uh, just moving on. If we think about the disabled people's movement, and and she speaks around how the disabled people movement hasn't fully embraced disabled people, and if disabled people want to work their way, if we're talking about groups and opportunities as well, and just drawing on that. Whereas you know, I'm a black disabled woman, and one of the things she draws on is if you don't. The way to fit in, you either assimilate, you internalize, or you withdraw. Mm. And going back to your point is, she makes a key point is, if you want to be able to achieve success, you will hear people say that that person, black person acts white. So they're assimilating. And we also see that with a lot of not with disabled people assimilating to be performing like a non-disabled person, try and hide their impairment. So... In terms of when we say, well, the door should open to success, in order to get that success sometime, you have to assimilate. Mm. And this is, these are some dangerous issues, what happens. And for many black people, I'm going to talk about race at the moment, is that what you start seeing is that people become, they de-racialize themselves. So therefore, or they de-impairment themselves, whatever we want to define it as. So that we start ignoring key aspects about our identity. And this is the thing that Kimberly William Crimshaw speaks about in terms of intersectional erasure. So we're not just talking about intersectional in terms of the different groups of identity, how we erase them from our thinking and how we force the individual to erase them, not just by creating hierarchies. We force individuals to erase key aspects about ourselves. So if we're talking about how do people, how we will we get another black Stephen Hawkins, I said I, I hope we would. But in reality, how easy is it for that person to achieve that and be who they are as a human being without erasing key aspects about their identity? I don't know. Miro says, Michelle, that even within the disability rights movement, there is the potential to disrupt the current model. If Miro is correct that that model needs to be disrupted, Michelle, how do you do it when leadership is so often connected to to social capital, educational background, ability to network with other people of power? How do you go about disrupting this model within the context of the disability rights movement so that the disability rights movement is not just Miro the discriminatory practices in the non-disabled world. Martin Luther King talks about, you know, being able, to be, being able to negotiate and bring things to the agenda. And I think the issues that we have with disabled people is very different with the issues for black non-disabled people. Because for many disabled people, we've also got to deal with the issues around accessing PA support to get to meetings. We're less likely to have the same level of access to services as white disabled people. Research has shown that. So when we talk about us being able to access meeting, English for some people is a second language. So you can't disrupt these meetings and get into a meeting if you cannot access them. That's another issue. I went to the Freedom Drive this year, me and my Miro was there. There was about three visible black disabled people in the room. That's disgusting with over 200 people. So. Three people trying to disrupt a meeting would be very, very, very hard. So in terms of the movement, it's about making, we have to make sure how do we get our issues on the agenda without it being tokenistic. That's the conversation we need to have. We, it's about, first of all, to look at how, how services are offered, because if, service, if disabled people are not having the same access to the level of support, we cannot get to the meeting. If the meetings are not made accessible in terms of language, um, making it accessible for people at the grassroots levels, they, the, they won't understand what's going on. So it's very difficult for me to answer your question, is how do we disrupt the issue? And as Millie Hill says, for some, you are referring to assimilate, you ignore your identity as a black person or as a woman, or you withdraw. And many 
black disabled people withdraw from the disability movement because they don't believe their issues are on the agenda around the table. Because I know that sometimes my invitation to things are purely on the basis of being a black disabled woman. I want it to be properly probably part of agenda and I'm not just there for the one-off topic because that isn't going to create change. So going back to your question, right now I don't have the information or I, don't know if you, I can't really think about how you can do that unless you've got more people and we can mobilise more disabled people and that's what Martin Luther King talks about. We have to excite, mobilise and we have to support disabled people to be able to bring them to the table, to be able to change the agenda. We haven't done the same work of what we've done with white disabled people in terms of mobilizing them getting people excited so that they will come to the table to be able to join in the discussion how we do that we need to proper resource and support and we need to when we talk around the table how do we think about disabled peoples from different backgrounds need so they can actually join around the table Mira, what do you make of this view that this issue of race uh, we could also add gender and sexual orientation are small potatoes compared to other subjects which command much more attention and seem to be much more vexed such as how do you deal with 10 years of austerity how do you deal with the medical model of disability the right to independent living euth euthanasia laws many of the things that we've discussed in these in these conversations w what do you make of that I isn't it hard for the disability rights to wrestle with these really structural huge issues and also at the same time do that kind of internal housekeeping and make sure that these issues issues of race, gender and sexual orientation are also dealt with? Well, I don't think that's, they're definitely not small potatoes and anybody who's, who says that is, is incredibly naive to the, to the points that Michelle's just made. What I would say is that, that the issues are interlinked. So, you know, issues around uh, austerity, social security, uh, aspects of, of trying to access uh, an, uh, or try to develop an inclusive education system, all of this will only succeed if it highlights and incorporates the issues around intersectionality uh, and the issues around how our identities from different backgrounds experience uh, forms of oppression and marginalization, because disability fluctuates depending on who you are and where you've come from, and, and, and as highlighted by, by Michelle's examples. What I, what I would say is that, and uh, as somebody who, you know, my, my PhD research has looked at, has looked at issues around uh, young people accessing the movement, and what I think was, was was quite key to that. And when I talk when I talk about disruption, what I what I mean is just trying to not necessarily disrupt dis disruption on the, on a on a micro level around individual meetings and, and so on. What I'm talking about is actually how how we get to the point where the movement itself reviews its own organisation and reviews its own ideology uh, towards challenging disablement because. If you take key issues like archiving activism, we talk so much around archiving to tell people's history around challenging social injustice. Um, but actually, those who are doing it, how do we ensure that they are providing uh, uh, people from all different backgrounds with the opportunities to be in the authority and leadership position? of capturing those stories and histories and capturing those issues. Because at the moment, I don't see enough evidence to say that that's happening. What I see is just very prominent organizations and individuals who are typically not politicized, typically not uh, coming from the, the backgrounds that, that we've, we've spoken about, and therefore will create a history of dis disability and a history of the disabled people's movement, which doesn't outwardly um, express this notion of white privilege or privilege of social of certain social classes, but it will just be a running theme throughout, which is then reinforced, as, as Michelle said, by people withdrawing or people assimilating or people not um, necessarily highlighting um, these issues or, uh, and, yeah, by extension, internalizing their, their, their marginalization and oppression. So there needs to be a review within the movement as to how we how we organize ourselves and, and our ideology towards tackling disability. But I also think there's something around this, this importance of safe spaces. And my research was with young tail people, and they talked about issues around not having the space to explore um, 
issues of what does a social model mean to them as young people or what does it mean to them as young people who, with from the lgbtq community uh, and 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 similar and what was was key was that there was no space to to talk to each other about questioning what has gone on before their involvement and what is the possibilities for them to to engage and participate within social movements because anything that challenges the current hierarchy or challenges the way that um, social movements are organized at the moment are, are judged to be a criticism or a threat to the leadership at mm. the moment. And we've got to get away from that. And that's where it is. It's not, it's not saying that, um, that we, want to, we want to destroy everything and build it up from the beginning. What we're, what we're saying is there needs to be that recognition that things have to change. And by change, it means including people from those those communities and from the background that have never had those opportunities to engage, and it does include it does, it does mean addressing the materiality issues that Michelle's talked about in terms of access and support and issues around how to actually engage in these different environments. But then there's also going on beyond that and saying, well, what's the point of the disabled people's movement? Because if it's sleep sleepwalking towards tackling disability um, within this notion of of the typical human being or the typical uh, uh, disabled person, then it's going to ultimately fail in, in its in its attempt to address social injustice for disabled people. Because I think, you know, for, for me, so, you know, as somebody who's been involved in activism since I was about 14, um, and of course my views have changed since then of getting involved, what I come to now is that as, as a social movement, we should be talking about how the whole of society should be organized and uh, operates and how it includes everybody, not just about tail people fitting into the system. So to do that, we need to actually identify and realize the, the importance of the intersectional aspects of our identity and ensure that when we're talking about inclusion and emancipation, we're talking about that for all people who are marginalized and oppressed, not just um, a simplistic or narrow view of, of, of a certain group of people. One of the more curious aspects of this conversation around race and disability and whether the disability rights movement has a race problem is how impairment can, to use the phrase, deracialize a black person within the, the UK context. Can you speak a little bit more to that, Michelle? One of the things that we'll often hear is that when people think about disabled people, they don't actually think about disabled people as women and as someone with a, of a, of, from a certain racial background. That's a very important point to, to think about. So when you go back to the point, the, 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 the question you're asking, does the, is there a different experience you're asking me, if I'm understanding you correctly, for black disabled people within the black disabled community, within the, within the black community, if, if I'm right in what you're asking? And it's not as simple as yes or no. And one of the things I'd done, when I'd done my research from my master's, I was looking at, whether independent living was different um, across different groups of people. from, And one of the things I, I realized is that if we look at, one of the things we have to think about, if we look at black people, I don't think they think of disability differently. I think the issue that we've got is access to resources. And if we think of many black people, they, 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 they move to the UK. So they're thinking around and I'm trying to get it to a point because often we think that black people do think of disability differently and the issue is is they have more other issues this is not an excuse in a way it's not a justification it's about thinking about the other issues they have to think about settlement how you settle in a country getting to know your way around and then when you put on top of that impairment I think it's going back to Kimberly William Crimshaw it's erased from their thinking. So what happens is, is that disabled people who are black from the black community is that because the families that maybe you're born into are trying to settle into a country that they don't know and don't understand and don't understand the system, there's a level it looks like is that they're, they, they, they're, it, the disabled person becomes ignored and isolated. And that's a big issue, and I think that is a disability movement responsibility as well, because what happens is 
in order to bring people, we have to be able to support newcomers into the country so they also feel part of the movement. Because if we don't recognize that people who come to the country having to settle and don't understand what resources are available to disabled people, then they won't have access to the wider society. Because if a person, if you're coming from a family where English is not the first language, you won't know how to access services. So therefore, it then looks like that the disabled person has become excluded and isolated. Because maybe often in the countries that they've come from, in order to access stuff, you need finances and resources to buy that. And they may think the same as when they come to this country. How do I access this? Is this support available? Do I have to pay for it? Do I, have, I don't have the resources because they're trying to settle themselves. But is the, the question you're asking me, is there a different experience for black disabled people? Yes, there is. But it's based on the experience of, the, of your background because you're, you're actually having a disadvantage because your position of how your starting point is, is very different from somebody who was born here. And I'll give you an example. My parents weren't born here. They came to the UK. So when I was born, they had no idea about impairment. They didn't understand the system, didn't understand the service. Hence why I ended, again, of that time, most disabled people either went to residential school or, se or a segregated school, special school. I went to a segregated school. Having conversation with my parents now, they wish they hadn't sent me there. So my, because I'm now an adult, and luckily I met up with other disabled, like-minded people, and I, you know, was able to understand the disability politics. And my parents were quite activists in their thinking as well. Had I not had that, that thinking and that upbringing, I wouldn't have been able to mobilize myself around. And when I look at other black disabled people, which often I don't see many black disabled people, when I do come across many black disabled people, and we look at the newcomers coming to the country, it's very similar experiences of not knowing their way around, having to survive. It's more survival. I'm in a very different position because I've gone past that survival stage where my parents was uh, settled. But you have to understand is the position of where someone is. It's around someone's settlement and how they have to think about how they move around and act in service. I'm hoping I'm asking your point right. So is there a difference in experience? Yes, there is a difference in experiences. But the issue is, is that we can't say um, what I don't want to say, and I don't want to be forced to say this neither, is that black disabled people are treated worse than white disabled people because that is often what I hear and they don't understand disability politics. Yes, they do, but the resources and the way they access services is very different.